Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will talk to you about photosynthesis. Several components are embedded in the thylakoid membrane that are involved in photosynthesis. We will discuss all of them. This thylakoid membrane contains one component that is called a photosystem. Inside of that membrane you have photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 along with many other protein complexes. A photosystem consists of a reaction center that will be surrounded by light harvesting complexes. In this image the purple structure is the photosystem and it surrounds a lavender structure that is called the reaction center. The photosystem has these pigments and those pigments are going to funnel light energy around until it reaches the reaction center. Within the reaction center we have a lavender square that lavender square is called the primary electron acceptor. Those electrons that were stimulated by photon energy that moved from pigment to pigment within the photosystem that eventually got to the reaction center it will now be handed off to the primary electron acceptor. What gives the electron to the primary electron acceptor is chlorophyll A. The chlorophyll pigment absorbs light energy. This energy moves the electron of chlorophyll from a ground state to an excited state. This excited state is unstable. Normally the electrons from the reaction center receives the excited electrons. These electrons were excited. Electrons typically are in their normal orbit when they're in their ground state. When you stimulate electrons, when you stimulate a molecule with energy and the molecule is made of hundreds of atoms, you can excite the electrons to move from their ground state, their normal orbit, to an a excited state, a different shell. So based on this image, the ground state is shell one. The excited state is shell two. As I add energy to this molecule, I excite the electron to move. Normally, the acceptor receives the excited electron. In an abnormal condition, like in lab today, lab 9.2, the acceptor, the primary electron acceptor, has been removed. So when you stimulate the molecule, the chlorophyll molecule, the photosystem molecule. When you stimulate the molecule that consists of many atoms and there's no electron acceptor there to receive the excited electron, then the electrons are going to fall back to their ground state and when they fall back they're going to release heat and they're going to release fluorescence. This fluorescence can be seen. This heat energy can be recorded. This energy can be recorded with a calorimeter. Since we don't have one, we're just going to look at the fluorescence. This shows the actual 
wavelength energy that is being absorbed when we do this experiment. So what is being absorbed is wavelength 400 to 450. What is going to be given off is wavelength 650 to 700. Therefore, what you see is going to be red. That was a abnormal condition. In normal conditions, the electron moves movement will not be hindered. The movement will continue eventually moving to the ETC. There are two types of photosystems in the thylakoid membrane. Each one will be stimulated very similarly. Radiant energy will stimulate the photosystem. The electrons will uh, be stimulated. They will move from pigment to pigment around the photosystem, eventually going to the reaction center. So the first photosystem we'll specifically talk about is two. Photosystem two functions first in the linear flow of electrons, but it was discovered second. The reaction center of PS2 contains a chlorophyll A molecule that is called P680. It is called P680 because it absorbs best the wavelength of 680 nanometers. How do they know which wavelength it absorbs best? They use a spectrophotometer. Using this spectrophotometer, we can record transmittance or absorbance. Transmittance is the fraction of light that passes through the sample, while absorbance is the fraction of light that is absorbed by the sample. Our sample that we're discussing is chlorophyll A. Photosystem 1 is the second photosystem involved in the linear flow of the light reaction, but it was discovered first. Photosystem 1 has a chlorophyll A molecule in its reaction center, but this chlorophyll A doesn't absorb at 680, best it absorbs at 700. So we're going to therefore call it P700. The flow of electrons through these photosystems occur in two ways. It's either a cyclic flow where it will only use PS1 or it will be nonlinear, which means it flows in a straight line going from PS2 to PS1. So let's first talk about the linear flow or the non-cyclic flow of electrons. So in this process you're going to produce ATP and NADPH by moving electrons that were stimulated by light energy. Step one, radiant energy stimulates electrons in the light harvesting complex. Step two, photon energy is passed among pigment, pigment molecules until it reaches P680. Step three, an excited electron from P680 is transferred to the primary electron acceptor. In lab, we're going to use an artificial electron acceptor. This artificial electron acceptor is called DCPIP. In the oxidized form, it's blue. In the reduced form, is clear. So when electrons are handed off to DCPIP, the solution turns clear. 
this shows the chemical structure of that reaction. Step four of the non-cyclic linear flow of electrons. We've stimulated the photosystem through sun. The electrons were moved from pigment to pigment until it reached chlorophyll A, which was P680. Now, it, water is going to be split to release electrons. These electrons are transferred from the hydrogen atom to P680. See, chlorophyll A was called P680. When the electrons moved from chlorophyll A to the primary electron acceptor, P680 became oxidized. It lost the electron. If it was neutral and it loses an electron, it would therefore become positive. Now, the electron has to be replaced. So, the hydrogen or the electrons from water being split are going to replenish the missing electron to P680 plus. Water will now supply the energy to do work for this photosynthet photosynthetic process via the electrons that are being released. So again, sunlight started the movement of electrons. Now what is going to keep replenishing the missing electrons will be water, energy from the bond between hydrogen and oxygen of water. Step five, now that we have split water and utilized the hydrogen or the electrons from the hydrogen, the byproduct, the waste, is oxygen. So the plant doesn't need the oxygen. So it releases the oxygen through the stomata. So in summary, sunlight activates this. Electrons move until they eventually get to P680. Electrons leave P680 and go to the primary electron acceptor. Water is split and electrons from water will replenish the missing electron for P680. Scientists had two theories on which molecule produced oxygen by the plant. Theory one suggested that carbon dioxide released oxygen but that was disproven. Theory two suggested that water was going to be split to release oxygen and that was accepted. 1930 C.B. Van Neel of Stanford University correctly theorized that oxygen was released when water was split not carbon dioxide. Each electron falls down from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. So the first photosystem was PS2 and the electrons are going to go to the electron transport chain and then they're eventually going to go to the next photosystem called PS1. The electrons are now moving through the electron transport chain. The first complex it reaches is PQ, plastoquinone. Then electrons will go to the cytochrome complex. Then the electrons will go to PC, plastocyanine. As the electrons move through the electron transport chain, energy is going to be produced. So wherever you see ETC, think of energy. So energy 
in the form of ATP is released by the ETC and it is going to drive the creation of a proton gradient that will be located in the thylakoid space. So as hydrogen are pumped into the thylakoid space, it's going to create proton motive force. Through a process called chemiosmosis, hydrogen is going to flow through an ATP synthase pump from the thylakoid space into the stroma and this turbine is going to spin therefore creating ATP. Diffusion of hydrogen across the membrane is going to drive this ATP synthase. Again it, it flows from concentration high to low. Therefore it will flow from the thylakoid space to the stroma. Step 9. The electrons have moved through the electron transport chain. Now the electrons are going to be handed off to a chlorophyll A molecule that is located in PS1. So similar to PS2, PS1 transfers light energy which excites P700. So light activates this photosystem, PS1. Electrons move from pigment to pigment. Electrons eventually get to chlorophyll A which absorbs wavelength best at 700. The electron is handed off to the primary electron acceptor. Once that electron moves, P700 becomes P700 plus. The electron has to be replenished. Where does this system get the next electron? From the electron transport chain. So the lost electron is replaced by the ETC which contains PQ and PC. So here's a summary summary of the electrons moving in the ETC. Step 10. From the electron acceptor and photosystem 1, each electron falls down an electron transport chain containing protein ferrodoxin. So after the electron leaves chlorophyll A 700 and goes to the primary electron acceptor it will then be handed off to another ETC that contains ferrodoxin. The electron will go from ferrodoxin to the next complex which is, which is called NADP reductase complex. Step 11. The electrons are then transferred therefore creating NADPH. The electrons of NADPH are now available for the Calvin cycle. So, so far we've created energy, ATP, we've created NADPH, and we've created oxygen. This summarizes the non-cyclic pathway of the light reaction of photosynthesis. This is another summary of that process. Now we will look at the cyclic electron flow. This is going to use only photosystem 1 to produce ATP only. It's not going to produce NADPH. This surplus of ATP is going to satisfy the high demand of the Calvin cycle. This is the summary of what happens once the electrons go from P700 to the primary electron acceptor 
the electrons are then handed off to ferrodoxin, then to cytochrome C, then to PC, and energy is produced only. Some organisms such as purple sulfur bacteria have PS1 but not PS2. So therefore bacteria are theorized to be older than other organisms like plants. So they theorize that the cyclic electron flow was here first and the linear flow evolved much later. This is purple bacteria. Now we're going to compare and contrast chemoosmosis of the chloroplast versus the mitochondria. Both are going to generate ATP. The mitochondria is going to transfer chemical energy from food to ATP. The chloroplast is going to transform light energy into chemical energy in the form of ATP. In the mitochondria, photons are pumped to the inner membrane space. In the chloroplast, protons are pumped into the thylakoid space. This image shows a side-by-side -side comparison. When we say the high hydrogen concentration, if we're talking about the mitochondria, the high hydrogen concentration is in the inner membrane space, but if we're talking about the chloroplast, it's in the thylakoid space. Then the electrons flow from high to low. The low concentration if it's in the plant, it will be the stroma. If it is in the mitochondria, it will be the matrix. So be able to compare and contrast these two. ATP and NADPH are produced on the bilayer side facing the stroma. This is where the Calvin cycle takes place. In summary, light reactions generate ATP and, in, and increase the potential energy of electrons by moving them from water to NADPH. This picture summarizes the entire process. The Calvin cycle uses ATP and NADPH that was produced in a light reaction and it's going to use carbon dioxide that came through the stomata and it's going to produce sugar. Now carbon dioxide can also be produced from the mitochondria that's inside of the plant. The Calvin cycle is just like the citric acid cycle in reference to regenerating its starting material. The molecule in the Calvin cycle that is going to be regenerated is ribulose bisphosphate. The cycle builds sugar from small molecules by using ATB and the reducing power of electrons carried by NADPH. carbon dioxide enters the cycle and leaves as a sugar called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. For net synthesis of one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, the cycle must take place three times, therefore fixing three molecules of carbon dioxide. So the dark reaction consists of three phases. 
The first one we'll look at is carbon fixation. This is going to be catalyzed by an enzyme called Rubisco. In this image, ribulose bisphosphate, which is a five carbon sugar, is going to unite with carbon dioxide to form a six carbon sugar. That is going to be a short lived molecule and then it's going to be catabolized into two three carbon molecules called three phosphoglycerate. That is one of the intermediates that is in glycolysis. This process is called carbon fixation. Step two is reduction. ATP that was produced in the cyclic and non-cyclic flow of electrons will give phosphate groups to the sugar called 3-phosphoglycerate therefore converting it into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Then 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to receive electrons from NADPH. NADPH was produced in the linear flow of the light reaction. The electron is going to be donated therefore turning 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate into something else. But before that occurs one of the phosphate groups have to come off of carbon-1. So ultimately 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate will become glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate once the electron was added and an inorganic phosphate is removed off. The addition of the hydrogen to this substrate is called reduction. The third step is the regeneration of the CO2 acceptor called ribulose bisphosphate. We have five glyceraldehyde 3 molecules. Each one is composed of three carbons. Five times three is 15. We're going to rearrange those carbons and create three carbon, three sugars that are called ribulose bisphosphate. So that is phase three or step three. Regeneration of the CO2 acceptor. What is needed for that to occur is rearrangement of the atoms, the carbon atoms, plus the addition of three more ATP. In summary, Three carbon dioxide enter, one glyceraldehyde three phosphate will exit, six NADPH will be used, and nine ATP will be used. Notice that we need extra ATP in comparison to NADPH. That's why the cyclic electron flow helps add the extra ATP. So be able to discuss this entire process called the dark reaction.